the idea is it's through our connecting with our creative spirit because connecting with ourselves creatively that is the medicine that is the kryptonite to watiko you know because then that same energy that was fueling the mind virus in a destructive way becomes constructively creatively expressed and and then we're once again we are playing a role in the incarnation of the deity that's the new cosmology it's not new you know i mean it's been so many people over the years have talked about it but i've just been as a modern western person just trying to articulate it in my own way welcome to rebel spirit radio exploring the frontiers of spirituality consciousness the esoteric and humanity's sacred relationship with a living earth i'm your host nick mather And in this episode, author Paul Levy returns to Rebel Spirit Radio to discuss his latest book, Undreaming Watiko. Paul talks about Watiko as revelation, how light is revealed through the darkness, our participation in the process of divine incarnation, Watiko as a catalyst for the evolution of the human species, and creative agency as an antidote to the counterfeiting spirit of Watiko. Also, please be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast on whatever platform you use to listen to or view podcasts. Your support is truly appreciated. Paul Levy is a pioneer in the field of spiritual emergence and has been practicing Tibetan Buddhism for over 35 years and was the coordinator of the Portland chapter of the Padmasambhava Buddha Center for over 20 years. Paul is the founder of the Awakening in the Dream Community in Portland, Oregon. He is the author of several books, including The Quantum Revelation, A Radical Synthesis of Science and Spirituality, Dispelling Watiko, Breaking the Curse of Evil, Watiko, Healing the Mind Virus that Plagues Our World, Awaken Darkness When Evil Becomes Your Father, The Madness of George W. Bush, A Reflection on Our Collective Psychosis, and the recently published Undreaming Watiko, Breaking the Spell of the Nightmare Mind Virus. Paul, welcome back to Rebel Spirit Radio. Yeah, I'm so happy to be here with you. Thank you, Nicholas. Yes. Yeah. Well, I am very happy to have you back on the program, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, speaking with you again. The episode that we recorded was one of my favorite episodes, so I'm very, very grateful for your time. And I wanted to say that uh, I enjoyed the new book, Undreaming with Tico. And I told you before hitting record that I found it a little bit more challenging than the other Watiko book. I still haven't read the first one. I'm, uh, I apologize, but I did read the second one in what's now a trilogy, but I found it challenging in a good way because I wanted to sit with some of the material and kind of absorb it and reflect upon it. So when I say it's challenging, I mean that in a, as a compliment. And so before we get into it, I wanted to see if this is correct because I actually listened to our previous conversation and I noticed themes that uh, you were talking about previously that appear in this book. And I wanted to know what is different in this book from the previous ones Uh, on a very easy way to say this. It seems like you are just going deeper and deeper and unpacking some themes that you have addressed before. Although it seems like there might be uh, some new themes in this book as well. Yeah, no, and I appreciate the question. And and I should just say, so my experience of, of, you know, these books, of writing these books, it's like there's this incredible, you know, stream and I have a little thimble and I'm like taking the water from the stream out of the thimble. And that's been the three books. The point is, is that it's practically endless tapping into the the revelation that is Watiko. And so this third book, it was originally the same as the second book, but it was so big that the publisher asked me to split them into two, you know, which I was happy to do. But there's definite differences that make this book, you know, its own thing. And so on the one hand, yeah, it's like just an amplification and a deepening of the idea of Watiko. But I'll just, you know, give a brief summation of of where and how it's different. On the one hand, I really go more into than ever before. The thing about Watiko, it's this this 
revelatory phenomena. It's a it's a revelation. And I, you know, more unfold and explain that the revelatory aspect and what that even means for something to be a revelation and how what you go is a revelation and all that. And then I, I start off the book by pointing out in my mind what the origin and the genesis of what Hiko is which is to be found in multi-generational ancestral trauma that hasn't been healed that we just in actually enacted unconsciously on the next of kin and this is you know in the collected works young talks about that evil actually propagates itself over the generations and this is exactly what he was pointing at that to the extent that we've been wounded by, you know, our culture, our parents, the educational system. And if we haven't healed that and integrated that, we then, without even knowing, just enact that on, you know, on our kids or on our partner or on our dog or whatever. So so I really go into the origin, you know, of Watiko being the ancestral unhealed trauma. But then I have a huge chapter on the main channel that Watiko works itself out or operates or covertly operates is through relationships. Mm -hmm. And I, I really do a deep dive into that, you know, because all of a sudden you'll be like friends with someone or married to someone and everything's harmonic and chill and Zen. And all of a sudden there'll be this like misunderstanding or, you know, oh, I feel not seen or there'll be these projections or there'll be this potential hurt or separation that'll come up and it can potentially destroy the relationship. And, you know, so I really go into that in a way that I never have in any of my other Watiko books. Then there's a huge chapter on the shamanic archetype. And I wrote this chapter right before, I finished it right before the lockdown, you know, in March, 2020. And, and I talk about that the shamanic archetype is the major archetype that's activated in the collective psyche, and, you know, which involves making the descent into the darkness of the unconscious, into the underworld. And, and I point out that we're all potential shamans in training. So that's one of the major chapters in the book, just really talking about the whole shamanic trip. And, and then... You know, I mean, there are just a may I go into, you know, answer to Job, which is Young's greatest work, at least in my mind, in which he's coming to terms with, with the divine darkness. And he was pointing out in that book that Satan is the godfather of humanity as a spiritual being. The point is, is that there's a special purpose in evil, that it's teaching us something that we incredibly need to understand. So there's that. And then I have a, an article on some people might know of this incredible clairvoyant Steiner, R R Rudolf Steiner, who was basically saying that the, you know, the greatest event in this time in our history is the incarnation of what he calls the etheric Christ. It's the second coming, but it's not in physical form that this etheric Christ is incarnating through the collective unconscious of humanity. And for us to actualize that in fear of Christ, we have to, there's no way around an encounter with what he calls the beast, which is radical evil. And, you know, that really recontextualizes what's happening in our world, because what Tico is a collective psychosis, but it's also the source of the greatest evil. And here we're encountering this incredible evil in our world. So, so there's that. And, um, and then... I have major chapters, two major chapters towards the end. One is on quantum physics, because Watiko is a quantum phenomena. It contains in a superposition of states, both the darkest evil and the highest good. It's actually helping us to awaken, just like light is a wave or a particle, depending on how you observe it. Well, how Watiko is going to manifest, it depends on how we're going to dream it. And are we going to continue to dream up this incredible destruction all around us? Or are we going to, to actually have the recognition of what Tico is a revelation that's showing us something about ourselves and about our own darkness and about our own light and about the incredible intrinsic creative power that we all have? So there's that. And then there's a huge chapter on, on synchronistic phenomena. And because I point out that one of the key sort of ways of dispelling Watiko 
is to to recognize the dreamlike nature and synchronicities are an expression of the dreamlike nature where an outer event actually gets reflected via an inner experience which is a description of a dream because in a dream the outer dreamscape is nothing other than our own inner psyche just externalized so seeing you know what i call the underlying synchronistic matrix that informs and gives shape to our world is to actually begin to recognize the dreamlike nature and i can say a lot more about that and seeing the dreamlike nature is is really when we establish ourselves in that viewpoint that's the way of really dispelling watiko so yeah there are a lot it's not just a repetitive thing at all that wouldn't have been interesting for me to write right. one bit and, and the thing which I'm really happy about is that all three books are by themselves self-sufficient. If that's the one book you'll read, you'll have a real sense of Watiko. And it's a body of work that complements each other. And it's such a vast body of work, the idea of the Watiko, you know, the mind virus is that I'm already imagining writing a fourth book. Okay. Yeah. I mean, honestly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you mentioned that in the uh, previous uh, conversation too, that you had a fourth one in mind. Um, yeah, yeah. So I forgot to mention that I wasn't going to ask you what Watiko is, and I was going to link to the previous conversation because you go yeah. into quite a bit of depth in that. And I just thought that it would save us some time. Yeah. And and you hit on a lot of the themes that I wanted to ask you about. And some of this, the ordering is a little bit, I wasn't quite clear on how I wanted to approach these. So I think I'm going to just approach this sort of how I have them listed, which is almost how you were just talking about them. And I thought we could start with revelation because I really liked this idea of Watiko as revelation. And I think that there are some, I, you know, revelations, a kind of a loaded term in some aspects. So what is it that you mean by revelation and that Watiko is a revelation? Yeah. So one of the things that I mean by revelation is that it's something that we as an ego, as a conscious ego or an intellect can't just think of for ourselves. It's something that will, will just manifest, be it in our mind, you know, or in the world that's something that it's like almost like a higher dimensional phenomena that's getting given to us. And, and I point out that what Tico, it, it, you know, one way to understand it is like, unlike in the time of Christ where, you know, here the divine was, was revealing itself, you know, from the heavens through the light coming down into our world Watiko is a revelation that's happening through the darkness. It's coming up from the underworld. And this reminds me of Jung. Jung says the big problem of our time is that we don't understand what's happening in our world. And he clarifies, he says, what's happening in our world is that the darkness of the soul is revealing itself, the darkness of the unconscious. And the idea is, is that light just doesn't, it's not just that light reveals darkness, it's that light is revealed through the darkness, which is a Kabbalistic idea that the deepest and greatest light emerges out of evil. And um, so on the one hand, there is that. On the other hand, you know, I talk uh, a bunch in this book, like you were saying about Revelation, but about in Tibetan Buddhist tradition, there's a thing called the hidden treasures. The, 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 in Tibetan, it's called terma. And... The idea is, is that hidden, encoded within the multidimensional fabric of our universe are these hidden treasures that exactly when they're needed, and it's very much like a symbol in a dream, they will be discovered by somebody who's destined to discover them. And, and they're just what the community, you know, needs to get to become awake or get more in balance, you know, just like when we're as an individual off balance or one-sided, we will literally dream up a symbol in the dream that if we resonate with it, it'll bring us back to who we are. And the idea that we have dreamed up, you know, the idea of Watiko, or you could say quantum physics is, is I actually have a whole thing that quantum physics is a modern day analog to a, a terma, to hidden treasure, which is offering the medicine for Watiko. But even Watiko is an actual revelatory phenomena. It's a dreamed up phenomena. 
and that because we're unconscious of what it's what it's showing us, it's just destroying us. But encoded in the collective psychosis of Watiko, it's actually catalyzing the evolution of our species. It's helping us to wake up. And so, you know, I really go into in depth in a number of chapters, in a number of chapters, the idea of of, of Watiko as a revelation. And but we all tend to, you know, it's so weird. We because we've gotten so brainwashed, we've we've all tended to sort of to push to the margins or revelatory experiences, you know, and if somebody, God forbid, they say, oh, I've had a revelation and it's not just helpful for me, it's helpful for the world. Well, they'll right away get put in the psych ward. But what if that's true? What if, you know, any one of us could be tapping into the revelatory nature of the universe because the universe is an oracle that's speaking symbolically and is a, a revelation, an unfolding revelation. And, you know, and that we all are like a piece of the puzzle. And it's just a sense of having the courage to bring forth what we're seeing. And that might be the very thing that we need to avert this incredible catastrophe that we're just conjuring up more and more closer and closer, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, just one thing I wanted to say is that with the revelation, it is apocalyptic in the sense of apocalypse means out of darkness which is what you were just uh suggesting yeah, it also means like the unveiling or the yeah 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 what is being hidden. that's the etymology right. of the word exactly yeah, yeah. um and i want to go back to this idea of revelation but i think that before i do so this was actually the last thing on my list but i, I think it's appropriate to actually discuss this now and you're kind of getting around it a little bit is that when I was reading this, one of the things that struck me this time that I don't recall being struck by this while reading the uh, previous book, but that you are actually presenting a kind of a cosmology of what reality is. And you, when you were mentioning the Terama text or the Terama, you know, you mentioned multidimensional, we're talking about quantum physics and whatnot. So I was wondering if you could maybe give a, <laughs> this is a loaded question, a sort of a summary perhaps of this, cos this cosmology that you are exploring. And yeah, 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 discovering. for sure. No, it is, it is a new mythology. And it's not, I'm not the only person to be, right. you know, articulating this. This is when you study the work of Jung or, or other visionaries, it's a similar idea. And that is that think of God and, you know, if people have an edge around the word God, just think of like a higher intelligence or a higher dimension of our being that, you know, yeah, this energy incarnated through one person 2000 years ago. You know, but all of, he was, you know, prepared to be the vessel with no darkness was in Christ at all. He was just the embodiment of the light. And then think about it. As soon as he came on the scene, there was Satan, who was the embodiment of the evil one of the darkness. And it was as if the opposites were totally polarized. If you see that, Christ and Satan, as a dreaming process, that was an expression of the polarization of the collective psyche at that time. And what I'm pointing out is that, and what Steiner is pointing out and Jung is pointing out is that, you know, because Jung, in answer to Job, talks about the, the Christification of many. That's his famous quote. And the idea is, is that we, as these creaturely, you know, people, we're, we, we actually all partake of the darkness. We're not just a Christ figure who's just all pure and light, that the deity wants to incarnate through us. And as God gets closer to incarnating through humanity, it's necessarily going to involve an encounter with evil. And the idea being that we've also been prepared to be the vessel that in a way reconciles the opposites that are intrinsic to the deity. Because Jung points out that the deity is a coincidence of opposites of both dark and light and we're all, you know, fated to wrestle with holding that creative tension of the opposites. You know, that's the symbol of the cross, you know, when you see it symbolically. And the idea being, if there's sufficient 
you know, people who are able to hold that creative tension without disassociating, in which case that person would develop a, a dis-ease in their, in their being. But if you're able to go through the agony, you know, because it's very painful to creatively hold that tension consciously and not dissociate, then out of that come, you know, comes the the revelation, the grace, the resurrected body, the blessing, the creative spirit. And, and that's our role to the extent that any of us are able to do that. We are then contributing to the incarnation of God in and through the human species, because that's what's happening is that God is incarnating through the collective unconscious, through humanity. That's what I'm saying. That's what Jung is saying. That's what Steiner is saying. And so many other people are saying the same thing. But the idea is, is that we're involved. We've gotten enlisted into the divine incarnation process. We're playing a key role in that process where we're actually participating. You know, in quantum physics is pointing out this is a participatory universe. It's not just something we're passively observing. You know, when I think about another chapter I have in the book, which is, I've never talked about this before. There's a Russian philosopher, Berdiev, mm -hmm. Nicholas Berdiev, who is pointing out the profound importance of being creative. And he says, when any of us are actually connecting with our creative spirit, in doing that, we become the vessel for the second coming. Mm -hmm. You know, as we express ourselves creatively, the deity then approaches us in that same way through our creative expression. But if we don't connect with our creative spirit and are just passively just waiting for the second coming, then Berdie F points out we'll only be seeing the crucified face of Christ. But the idea is it's through our connecting with our creative spirit because connecting with ourselves creatively, that is the medicine, that is the kryptonite to Watiko, you know, because then that same energy that was fueling the mind virus in a destructive way becomes constructively, creatively expressed. And, and then we're, once again, we are playing a role in the incarnation of the deity. That's the new cosmology. It's not new. You know, I mean, it's been so many people over the years have talked about it, but I've just been as a modern Western person, just trying to articulate it in my own way. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I really like the uh, chapter on, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right, Burgio's and this idea of creation and creativity and that we are creators. And you quoted him that the unexpressed or repressed creativity is what feeds the evil aspect of Watiko. And maybe you're paraphrasing there, so not a direct quote, I don't think. Yeah, um, yeah. And this gets to one of the things I wanted to speak with you about, because it's something I've been thinking of, is in relation to all of this, you know, you're talking about the individual and you, you talk about the angel and there is the angel of individuation, which, you know, speaks towards Jung. The angel is the eternally active source of our being. It's, you also explain it as the transcendent part of our personality. And one of the things I've been thinking a lot about lately is the diamond. You know, you have that from Socrates, right? To the diamond, which gets unfortunately sort of uh, demonized to the demon, right? And it is this daimon in Latin becomes the genius. And genius is etymologically connected to Genesis, which is creation. Right. And so I find it really interesting in the sense that it seems like and this is what you said, that our salvation then is our creativity. Yeah, yeah. And right, exactly. Now, the thing, you know, I talk a lot about, I have a chapter on the angel, right? Because what Tico, it's this, this daimonic energy, you know, and a daimonic energy is a higher dimensional energy that can possess an ego. A person can become taken over by the daimon you know, and literally possess or a group of people, and they then become the channel to act it out. And so, the, you know, the counterpoint, you know, to this daimonic energy is the angel. And the daimon is the guiding spirit, the inner voice, you know, it helps us find, like you were saying, our genius, our calling, 
you know, connect with our inner voice, with our vocation and all that. And encoded in the daimon is the creative spirit. But if we if we don't relate to it consciously, you know, it constellates negatively and becomes a demon. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and it's just an example, like the idea of the angel is we have a celestial counterpart that's with us all throughout our lives. And the whole idea is to develop intimate relationship with this part, you know, and I think about in the, in the work of Jung, where he, you know, in his red book, he talks about, he was having this direct encounter with this being, with this seeming entity who lived inside of his psyche. He named it Philemon. And he couldn't believe that Philemon, it was like there was a living being inside of his psyche who knew stuff that Jung didn't know and was teaching young stuff and you know he was having a direct experience of what he calls the reality of the psyche and interestingly young calls the reality of the psyche the greatest discovery in in the entire 20th century in the realm of psychology in other words it's not just an objective realm that exists in the way we think of something being objective it's not just merely subjective imagination but there's a realm that couples the subjective and the objective. It's the realm of visions and dreams, and it's where shamans, you know, operate. And, and in this realm, there are, we can access the diamond. We can access the angel that actually is guiding us and helping us and inspiring us. And that's, you know, I think about how I've created my work. Like when I'll read my books, so often or pretty much all the time my experience is wow this is really good who who wrote this mm. and because i'm not identified with being the writer because when it's really flowing through me i'm just an open instrument plugged into the creative source and something is coming through me and just interestingly in the therapy that young created his whole point was to connect somebody the person the client with their daimon, with their inner guidance. He called it the ego self axis. And it's like having an intimate relationship. It's like there's a dialogue back and forth. And But it's important, I think, to differentiate between the voice of like just the neurotic monkey mind that we need to just sort of disengage from and ignore when the daimon is speaking and it has a different energetic signature. I just learned to distinguish that energy and to pay attention. Because then it's like I'm getting dictates from the boss and then I'm just an employee just being in service and I'm just offering myself as a conduit, you know. So that's in essence the idea. Okay. And is with Tico the energy, the force, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how to express this, that prevents us from connecting to or seeing or recognizing that angel or that daimon yeah 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 well what tico one way of envisioning what tico is that you know young says like everything living thirsts for individuation in other words mm -hmm. to become who one is you know and and a way to conceive of what tico it's like this adversarial force in us whether we experience that as resistance or it's like actively stopping us from, you know, connecting with ourselves or with our creativity. You know, I mean, I can, my experiences, you know, as I get closer and closer to the light, to my light, to who I am, to expressing myself creatively, it seems to be constellating the deeper, darker evil forces, both in my mind and in the world to try to stop me. And I've learned to interpret that like, oh, instead of that being a bad thing or an expression of how screwed up I am, no, that's the best news I've heard all day. That's a sign that I'm getting really close to something. Right. So it's almost like a mathematical equation. And I think that can be really helpful to envision things in that way. So it's like, you know, if you think of Otiko having a job, his job, its job is to do everything it can to stop us from remembering who we are. But I think of, of, of Buddha Shakyamuni under the Bodhi tree, as he's, you know, in the process of becoming enlightened, what happened? Here's, here's, here's Mara, the evil one, all the forces of darkness who are trying to stop him. 
And and I point out in, I think in one of my Watiko books, I'm not sure which one, that on the surface, these darker forces seem to be obstructing and obscurations and, you know, really contrary and, you know, antagonistic to the Buddha, but they're actually helping the Buddha. The Buddha then, by going through that experience, mm. attained realization which he he wouldn't have developed the muscle of realization without these adversarial forces. Right. So that's where I point out that Watiko, which is the source of the greatest evil, is actually the most incredible catalyst for the evolution of our species. Because going back to that cosmology, the idea is, is that we then can actually remember and connect, you know, and have the realization that we're playing uh, a participatory role in our own evolution, you know, that mind and matter are not separate. That's the synchronistic dreamlike universe. And not only are they not separate and reflecting each other, but our mind can itself become aware of that interconnection. And that changes everything. Right. Right. Yeah. I think the quote that you've got, I had this written out what you were just saying is suppressing the light actually reveals the darkness thereby ultimately serving the light yeah 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 that's why i created in my new book i have all these these acronyms that i just you right. know very, very <laughs> fun way i created and there's one of them i think it's called it's pronounced ritzy r-t-s-e revelation through suppressing suppressing exposure so the idea being is that Say there are darker forces and somebody is like shining a light on the darker forces to expose them. Well, the darker forces will then, if they truly are darker forces, will try to destroy the person shining the light, which instead of destroying the light is actually revealing to the world, oh, we're darker forces. We are evil. And so, you know, and that process is playing out all over the world. Yeah. You know, like for example, when like when 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 you know, like certain I won't get specific, like whistleblowers will be shedding light on the incredible evil of our government or the, the powers that be or the globalists or whatever you call it, the deep state. And then what does the deep state do? Oh, it tries to destroy the whistleblower. Well, by doing that, they're revealing to the world that what the whistleblower is pointing at is true. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think along all those lines too, and this gets back to the importance of the creativity is that there needs to be a good amount of disobedience that there are these, you know, and the, this is with Tico, these archons and these structures. And I was thinking of it in terms of when you were writing about Steiner and the etheric Christ, and how he describes the beast. And uh, you noted that before the etheric Christ could be properly understood, you have to encounter the beast. And you noted that is radically evil. And, you know, I, I actually just read the, reread the book of Revelations. And from a scholarly perspective, the beast equals Rome and Rome equals empire. And I see that now as this corporate consumerist military industrial media empire, you know, that the, the empire never ended. And right. this is what Philip K. Dick said. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that is in a sense with Tico and it's the creativity to go against that, to have the courage to go against that is how we can defeat it, but we have to see it first, right? Um, yeah, yeah. So there are a couple things. One is, I mean, you're totally right. I appreciate your articulation, and you know the importance of of not just be unreflectively obedient to authority, you know, and because then we become like you know these these sheep who you know fall into groupthink, and like Young points out when there's like a mob and a collective agreement or a collective spell, you know, the the intelligence of all of the people involved, it just falls to the low, lowest common denominator. And that's why he's saying that the only way for us to deal with this is individually, 
we have to reflect and individuate and wake up to the as much as we can that, yeah, it can be helpful to create new laws and legislation and this and that, but that's only palliative care. That only goes so far. And so, you know, on the one hand, that that is really, really important to understand. And then when we model that, it's, con- you know, just like what Tico is contagious, us doing that and embodying our creativity and not just, you know, being obedient, you know, because the idea is when you see what's happening in the world as a dream, say if somebody came into my office today and they had a dream and the dream was exactly what's happening in the world and they would say, oh, how do you interpret this dream? Well, I would say, well, clearly it's an expression that you're not in touch with your creative power because you've outsourced it and all the powers that be are using your creative power against you, you know, to serve the state. And and that's exactly like a way of describing Watiko because Watiko has no creativity on its own. And like the Bible says, it calls it the counterfeiting spirit. It just impersonates us. And then it offers us a fictitious version of who we are. And that's the greatest danger Young was pointing at for us to identify with a fictitious identity. And then, you know, if we then are not awake when Watiko is offering us a limited version of ourselves, oh, I'm wounded, I'm traumatized, and then we like identify with that, then Watiko has us, then it can control us and manipulate us. And if you think about what I'm describing, here Watiko can't steal our soul, but it tricks us into giving it away. And then we identify with who we're not and we disconnect from who we are and we forget about our creative agency, that's a recipe for madness. And, and that's Watiko. And that's why the profound importance of like actually remembering our nature, who we are, and what is our nature? That's such a cliche. And I point out, yeah, our nature is by its very nature creative. And so when we actually have realization of our nature, we embody and express ourselves creatively and to the extent we ex- express ourselves creatively, we deepen our realization, our, our realization of our nature in a positive feedback loop that literally creates light upon light. And that's available to us. Each one of us has, we already have, we're like already in possession of this incredible technology and the technology is ourselves. We already, you know, not only possess the solution, we are the solution, but we don't realize it. And because we don't realize it, then the Watiko bug, which has no creativity, plugs into our own creativity, turning it against us. But that's the revelation. It's showing us, oh, I'm not awake to the role that the psyche plays in creating and giving shape to and informing world events. So, yeah, and this is an individual process that each one of us is going through in our own way. And to the extent that any of us has realization of this and really integrates it and embodies it, that helps all of us because this realization, just like what Tico can go viral and is contagious, this realization can go viral and is contagious in a way that can catalyze a global awakening. Yeah, I like that. And one of the reasons I really respond to that is I have become very uh, cautious of the language of awakening simply because whenever you hear it, it's almost always like an awakening to truth, right? That, you know, now I see the truth. And what I normally see happening is people are kind of awakening to a different paradigm that may not necessarily be true. And you actually mentioned that in the book that there's this, sometimes this arrogance and you had one of those acronyms in there that, uh, you know, sometimes people are like, wake up. But what I like is the way you're expressing this is that it's not awakening to a paradigm or a truth, but it's an awakening to the self. Yeah. And that's ever deepening. So, you know, the edge. I have around, because I appreciate you bringing this up, the edge around the word awakening, or so many people talk about, oh, I had an awakening, or I, but, and there's like sort of this implication of being, of it being final, like, oh, I've, I've, I'm enlightened. And, you know, I mean, I think of, you know, like my teachers, these great lamas and, you know, and other people who are like, 
no, no, no. I'm always increasing and deepening my altruism and opening my heart even more and deepening my awakening. And and yeah, I, I had an awakening 40 plus years ago that was overwhelming and it radically reconfigured my life and, you know, how I perceive things and interpret reality and all that. And I'm a work in progress, you know, because based on my own experience, yeah, the more light I'm able to bring forth, the deeper, the larger the shore of the unconscious. But so it's not like it banishes the unconscious because we're co connected with the collective unconscious of our species. But what it does do, it makes that boundary more permeable so that we're able to go back and forth between the conscious and the unconscious and thereby metabolize and integrate it instead of it just being inaccessible and then identified with the light. And then we become possessed by the darkness of the unconscious and act it out. So, you know, I think that's really important. And I try to model that, that as somebody who's had some form of awakening, but in no way am I, have I ever said, oh, I'm this awakened person. I mean, my friends would laugh at that. No, but I'm somebody who, when the universe reflects back my unconscious shadow, I really train myself to reflect upon that, you know, which I see so many people who don't do that, that there's some sort of reflection of their unconscious and they just immediately just are threatened by that or they demonize that or they look away and that looking away is Watiko. Yeah. How can you get someone to not look away? Yeah, well, here's the thing. So, you know, and this is young again, he talks about, if people's eyes can't see, because so many people are fixed in a viewpoint and Watiko is a form of blindness, you know, and it's a form of blindness. It's very peculiar that actually it doesn't know it's blind and it actually thinks it's sighted mm -hmm. and it thinks it's more sighted than people who actually see. And so what Jung says is, yeah, when you reflect back, if you try to like help them to see the light, but if their eyes are blind, then the one who's really blind is you. Mm. So it's a much better strategy to teach people the art of seeing. And of course, how does one do that? Dad, I have no idea. I mean, I'm continually, because I'm continually up against my edge. I have so many people in my world who I feel are incredibly asleep in certain ways. And there are these don't go there zones. Oh, I bet I'm not right. mentioning this or the vaccine or Ukraine or Trump or Putin or whatever. And I've learned, oh, yeah. And this is a new like sort of ability that we've all had to kind of cultivate and that I've never, you know, I just didn't have to, to do, you know, in the past. And, you know, so I don't really know how to answer that question. How do you make people see, you know, I guess the one thing that comes up is to the extent that we can just embody to whatever degree we are seeing with the awareness that we have blind spots, right. all of us. I mean, that's the nature of perception and that we can easily become entranced by, you see, if we think something is objectively true, being like a dream, the universe will offer us all the evidence confirming the seeming objective truth of our viewpoint, which then convinces us, convinces us that what we're saying is accurate. So we become more entranced and fixed in our viewpoint and the more entrenched we become in our viewpoint, the more the universe offers us, you know, confirmation that it is objective. That's, you know, ad infinitum, that's a self-reinforcing feedback loop whose origin is our own mind. And that's to actually entrance ourselves and put ourselves under a spell. Mm -hmm. And that's what Tico. Right. And so, and how do you engage with somebody in who's under that spell? That that's really, that's the question, you know, and I'm not, I'm not sure how to answer that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's fair. And, you know, it also seems that it's not just the question of how can you get someone else to see, but how can I see, you know? And I think, you know, like you said, we each have to approach that in our own way. And, you know, I, you, you wrote here at one point, you, you noted that like, I think Jung and Freud both noted that there's something inside of us that really wants to stay sick and really wants right. to stay asleep. And that's the way I've kind of dug into it, where I am asking myself these things. Like if I find myself kind of 
getting into depression or something. And I'm like, well, or thinking, you know, oh, woe is me for, you know, life or what have you. I will stop and ask myself, so is there a part of me that actually really likes this? Yeah. Yeah. In a perverse way. Right. And Jung was, he was talking about, there's this morbid part of the personality. That's his phrase that has a will to be ill and it's perverse. And that's related to the death instinct of Freud. And it's sort of the contrary to the life instinct that wants to individuate. And out of that comes this tension. And the idea is, is that that's not necessarily pathological, but that those are counter forces. That's the the tension of the opposites, the life and death. And it's up to us. That's why in the Bible, I think it says something like, you know, choose life over death, because, you know, in a sense, the choice is really ours as far as w- which of those energies do we invest our attention and awareness in. And but that is actually really, really interesting because I mean, I see that in myself. I've seen that in myself for years. The part of me that seemingly has an agenda or is invested in self-sabotage or keeping myself small or destroying myself when I really amplify it. And that's what Tico. I mean, that's another way of describing what Tico, because you see, think about what Tico when you know like i I think about it in my own process i had a direct personal encounter with it it almost killed me and i saw oh it wants to make me its host Hmm. and such that you know it would ultimately kill me and destroy me and that when i amplified it that's where it was going and but then i began to realize oh that same energy that's fueling my potential destruction I can, if I can tap in and access that same energy and in a way re-channel it into something constructive or particularly creative, and then that captures my imagination where I invest my attention in that way, that is a way of alchemically transmuting that morbid part of the personality, that death instinct, that will to be ill, Watiko, into something positive. Because that's the idea is that we're all these shamans and we're all these alchemists and it's our job to, you know, to engage with this energy and to channel it towards the light, towards something constructive and creative. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I'm thinking about here is that I like that a huge part of your work is calling for a sort of self-examination that we really have to look in to ourselves. And I don't think that you've actually, I don't remember, I know it's not in the new book and I don't remember if it was in the previous one, but one of the things that comes to mind when I start thinking about self-examination and a daimon is Socrates and maybe one of the approaches that can be taken is just asking people good questions to get them to start thinking. And instead of saying, because what we see so often is people saying, oh, you're asleep, you need to wake up and so on and so forth, or telling them, oh, I think this is what's going on to maybe just learn to ask people really probing leading questions to get them to engage in that process of well, self-examination. It's interesting, interesting you say that because when I wrote my quantum physics book, one of the things that, you know, it taught me by, you know, studying all these quantum physicists was that they were basically saying that it's more important to ask the right question than to mm-hmm. find the right answer. Right. But there's something, you know, when it makes me think of like with Einstein, you know, when it was reflected back to him, oh, you're such a genius. He was like, no, 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 it's not that. It's just that I'm incredibly curious. He called it the holy curiosity, you know, and just to be really open. But the thing is, if you offer somebody the right question or a good question, that's not enough at all. It's also depending on if they're open to receiving that question and does it activate their unconscious to start dreaming you know, and that's where for me, I'm like, 
so many things that happen on a given day are so interesting to me, just the energetic of it, the dynamic, psychologically, spiritually, that it'll just activate all of these like reflections and contemplations. And I can spend just like hours just, just tripping out on different things. Mm -hmm. And it's a way of helping me, you know, deepen my own individuation or my own connection with myself, you know? Yeah. Now you also have a chapter on synchronicity and I'm wondering if this is connected to uh, what we're just talking about is, and, and I like that you also, instead, you, instead of synchronicity, you uh, present another term, simulcausality, which I oh, really yeah. liked, but I was right. wondering if these synchronicities or simulcausality are, you know, these interruptions into the 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 world as we see it if those can also help us see what tico yeah yeah the idea like a synchronicity is, is like a fissure in in yeah. you know the veil of reality such that like the deeper underlying oneness you know is revealing itself is showing others oh, an actual connectedness between the inner and the outer between matter and mind and and yeah, I'm glad you brought up like I coined this phrase um simul causality because Jung described synchronicity. I mean, he was so blown away by it. It took him over 20 years of thinking about it before he actually published anything. And um, because he wanted to have a credibility and be taken seriously, and and the causality that like a cause precedes an effect was such an established dogma in the in the collective unconscious of humanity. So he called that he he was afraid, you know, to threaten this like this sacred dogma of causality. But he called synchronicity an a causal connecting principle. And but that word a causal created real misunderstanding because a causal, the dictionary definition means without a cause, that there, it's non-causal. And that's confusing because there's not a causality in the way that we we've been accustomed to it. It's not linear causality, you know, that happens in linear time, but there is some form of causality that happens in a synchronicity that we're just not familiar with. It's almost like between these different dimensions that happen instantaneously, that happen simultaneously out of time, simul causal. That's why I've coined that phrase to sort of heal the confusion around a causal, you know, which people equate with meaning, you know, without a cause. It's just that the cause is something that we're not familiar with. And he was really pointing out, you know, that mind and matter, that spirit and the physical world, you know, are not separate. And that's, he was more and more approaching and pointing at the dreamlike nature. And he would even, he would use the word dreamlike that this world is dreamlike, you know? So he was tuned into that. I mean, he was tuned into what he go. Yeah. In one of my books I talk about, he was completely pointing at what he go. He didn't have the name for it. And he called it a number of different names, you know, but yeah, he was really switched on to that. So yeah, synchronicity, when you have the understanding of synchronicity is actually a revelation or an emanation or an expression you know, or manifestation of the deeper dreamlike nature, you know, and when you see that, it all of a sudden expands your awareness, it opens your heart, it unlocks your creativity, it deepens your compassion. And, and that's the way, you know, to heal the mind virus. Yeah, I, I like that. And, you know, what really is kind of coming to mind here, and this goes back to me asking you this question about a cosmology that you're kind of exploring and unpacking, you know, is that it's a different model of our existence, you know, to, and it's old, but it's new. It's old in the, many of the Asian traditions that it's like a dream. It's dreamlike in nature. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. it's participatory, you know, this gets into the quantum physics and it seems like it's also telling us that, you know, part of maybe the Watiko is just saying all there is, is matter. 
you know, matter and motion in a spiritless universe. But this new cosmology and the recognition of our participatory uh, abilities in this and that it's dreamlike and that it's not that we don't quite understand causation. You know, it seems like that cosmology is what is perhaps emerging and can help us see with Tico, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, the, you know, I point out in the book, I mean, that the prevailing scientific materialistic worldview is itself like that's the lens which like brings in the Watiko mind right. virus into our mind you know that actually sees the fundamental primary substance of this universe as matter you know and it really sort of marginalizes the role that consciousness plays in that right and yeah and the thing about you see the thing about Watiko it's a form of blindness and it's heavily invested in having us not see it because as long as we don't see what Tico, you know, how it operates in the world, how it operates through our inner reactions or unconscious reactions, how it operates in our mind, as long as we don't see what Tico, then it has power over us. Right. But when you see it, then all of a sudden the seeing of it takes away its power hmm. and, you know, and you become empowered. So that's why with all of my books on Watiko, I'm continually pointing out, you know, pointing at Watiko in a way where I'm trying to help people to see it, you know, and the thing which is interesting is the seeing of Watiko, it transforms two things. It transforms Watiko, it takes away its power, and it transforms us, right. you know, and that's why, you know, not only am I pointing out the importance of seeing it, but that's why Watiko is its job is to, it's so elusive and shape-shifting and it's de a deceiver. It's doing everything in its power to make us not see it. And, you know, I mean, that's really the foundation of my work is trying to like open people's eyes to see it. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that we're uh, just about out of time, uh, but the last thing I wanted to note was that I like that there's this kind of emphasis on the Christ myth and the, you know, the Christ symbolism. And I think that that's so important because I think that literalness is also a symptom of Watiko and to bring forth the symbolism of this imagery is really important. And, you know, you begin by discussing, you know, Wilhelm Reich. And I like this because he talks about the murder of Christ and you refer to that as turning against our own light. And it seems like that Christ symbol is, and when we see it as symbol, is all about the seeing our own light and the rebirth, the remembering of who we are, which is, I think, the main message of the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and I, I do talk about Christ all throughout the book as a yeah. symbol of the higher self yeah. and the, the, the Reich, the Wilhelm Reich, the Murder of Christ book. There's a chapter on that, you know, which I'd read that so many years ago and then when i recently picked it up again and i it blew my mind he's talking about the emotional plague of humanity and the murder of christ and that is what tico he's pointing at what tico and he's saying part of like a way of understanding the myth of christ when you see it symbolically is that you know who are the murderers of christ we are that we are moment by moment unconsciously participating in murdering our own higher self and that's been rendered unconscious, you know, and it becomes chronic. And there's no one else doing that to us. We are doing that to ourselves. And I point out that, you know, there's a big chapter where I point out that the greatest young points out that the sickness of humanity right now is the sickness of, of disassociation, mm -hmm. that the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing, but that out of that dissociate that sickness of dissociation it's like a pregnancy something's being born out of that and and i point out that you know when you see christ symbolically you know as the symbolizing the higher self that interestingly in the apocryphal text christ is pointing out to his disciples to see the christ event symbolically mm -hmm. you know, instead of like in a literal way and and interesting that's exactly christ and young were in agreement young was 
spent his whole life trying to bring, you know, to bring in symbolic awareness and, you know, and symbols are the language of dreams. And Christ is a perfect symbol because what is a symbol? It's different than a sign, which is just very literal and has a clear meaning, like one way do not enter that has a clear meaning. That's a sign. A symbol is a coincidence of opposites. Think about Christ. He was a human being and he was God. Those are mutually exclusive. And being a symbol, he brought them, those two together. And so think about it. We dreamed up as a species, this, you know, this Christ symbol to reflect back to us, the unconscious part of us, you know, that we're unaware of and that we've actually unconsciously are murdering moment by moment. And yeah, so all throughout the book, there's, I, I definitely, you know, contemplate the Christ symbol in a way that, that is just helping us so much, yeah. you know, to really um, take it within ourselves and to actualize what the symbol is revealing because the symbol is an emanation of a deeper sort of mystery and when you get in resonance with the symbol it actually brings you and introduces you to that deeper place that it itself is an emanation of or or in, in you know in another way of saying it 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 connects us with what the symbol symbolizes with which is the deeper higher dimensional place and and that really unlocks something and helps us to remember and it unlocks all of our psychic creative energy, potentially, you know, to be channeled with love and compassion and, and in a creative way, instead of just where we're re-traumatizing ourselves in a black hole where we're endlessly just killing ourselves. And that process that I'm describing is an individual process, but it's actually getting playing out writ large on the world stage. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's the idea of what Tico is seeing what's happening in the world is actually this representation or reflection of what's happening inside of our very being. Yeah. As within, so without. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. Well, Paul, I know that we are out of time. So let me ask you very quickly, what is coming up next for you? Yeah. Well, I just gave, you know, the book is getting released today. I just okay. gave the book launch last night. And so now there's just going to be you know, just interviews like this, you're really the first one on the very first day of the book release. And I have a new book, not a new book, the quantum physics book is coming out in a year that I've okay. written that to a degree. And it's a way better publisher, you know, that I'll, I'll come out with that. And yeah, I'm just going to be, you know, I'm getting so many demands on my time, but I'm really needing to more carve out time to do more creative writing and start writing, you know, whether it's my fourth book on Watiko or however it's going to be, you know, come out. And yeah, you know, so I feel like a mother who's just given birth. <laughs> and now, you know, the book is in people's hands. And I'm just excited. Yeah. To, because it feels like something came through the book. Yeah. Like I'm saying, I'm just the instrument. And it's real medicine for people. Yeah. And it's really going to complement the first two Wotiko books. And so I'm just excited to see how, yeah. how people experience it. Yeah, yeah. Well, like I said, I really enjoyed it. And I think that, you know, to use a metaphor here, I think that you are helping to midwife us into something that's way better. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. 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 And before I go a website, where can people go to find out more about yeah, you? So work? People, if they want to awaken in the dream, just to go to awaken in the dream dot com. Okay. That's my website, and there's just a ton of articles all for free and interviews. You know, there's no paywall. You know, it's not monetized. You know, you can buy my books or book a session. That's the only money thing. But I just want to make this information available because it's so helping me, you know, to like as I more deeply, you know, integrate this. And, you know, in writing and talking about it, that's the way I'm deepening my realization and I just want to share it with people. And so that's that's where people can access my work. Yeah, yeah. wonderful. Well, I will put a link for that and for the new Vatico book in the show notes in the video description. And I just wanted to say it was a privilege to speak with you. I'm honored that I'm like one of the first uh, people to yeah, talk yeah. with you about this one. But as usual, it was uh, wonderful speaking with you. And I so thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. So thank you for your time. And thank you for the work that you're doing to try to bring healing to the world. Really, thank you so much for the invitation, Nicholas. Thank you. And that's a wrap on episode 90 of Rebel Spirit Radio. I'm really getting up there, aren't I? 
<laughs> thank you so much for listening or watching if you're a part of my YouTube audience or view this on Spotify. If you like what I do here on Rebel Spirit Radio and would like to support my work, and please consider supporting my work, uh, consider becoming a patron. Uh, you can find the link for the Patreon in the show notes or video description. And of course, if you'd like to make a one-time donation, you can still do so via PayPal. I will be tremendously, incredibly grateful for any support that you can provide. Another way that you can help the podcast is to share it with friends, family, coworkers, even anyone that you think will enjoy it and share it on social media too. help me grow my audience. That really is one of the best ways that you can help and support the podcast. So one more time, if you feel moved by the rebel spirit and I sure hope that you do, then please, by all means, help me share the good news. Also, if you enjoyed this podcast, please make sure to give it a positive rating on whatever platform you use to listen to or view podcasts. And please subscribe. For those viewing on YouTube, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Make sure you hit that notification bell so you'll be informed when I upload new content. I'm Nick Mather, and you've been listening to or watching Rebel Spirit Radio. Until next time, may you be in peace, may you flourish in all possible ways, and may you continue to nurture your Rebel Spirit. <laughs>